Hi, everyone. This is Alex Stepian and Victoria Walker from Trade Market to talk about trademark law and intellectual property protection. How are you doing, Victoria? I'm well. How are you? All's good over here uh, across the big pond. Uh, how's, <laughs> yeah. the weather? how's the weather uh, in your parts, in your neck of the woods? <laughs> It is. So I'm in Charlotte, North Carolina. So it is hot, humid, sunny. Um, you know, it's the end of summer weather. So as soon as you go outside, you start to sweat. And I love it. <laughs> How about you? <laughs> it's exactly the same here. So uh, yeah. high five, high five uh, with, yeah. with that. Um, hot weather. Do love you it. enjoy this type of weather, though? Or uh, do you do I, I relish weather? it. I relish it. Uh, yes. I think this is a uh, thriving. Uh, these are thriving circumstances for uh, for the human uh, for the human species. So I, I don't really don't get why people moved up north and have yep. to deal with snow. It's a mystery to me, but some mysteries are. Yeah. <laughs> I'm uh, originally so I'm from Buffalo, New York, which is uh, you can call it Southern Canada, basically. And it is, I mean, it's freezing. It's you know, snowstorms, and I got away from there as soon as I could. I I can't stand the cold. It's not it's not fun. <laughs> Victoria, tell us a few words about yourself uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with one of Trademark's star trademark attorneys. <laughs> Oh, well, thank you, Alex. I am Victoria Velezquez Walker. I'm a trademark and intellectual property attorney here at Trademarkia. I mostly focus on uh, trademarks and copyright registration. Um, my passion is helping um, Latina owned businesses grow and scale um, um, their businesses. So um, I help all clients, but uh, Latinas is my heart and soul. Victoria, I have some questions about trademark law. So, uh, so what do you say we jump jump in? Let's do it. All right. So, what is the difference between a trademark and a copyright? Yeah. So that is uh, a good question, and, and it's a common question. So, a uh, trademark and copyrights are obviously two forms of intellectual property that exist. Um, a trademark is what I like to call um, your brand identity. It is a source identifier. So it can be anything, almost anything that you're using um, in the marketplace to identify your business. There's very common ones um, that we all know know about your business name, logo, slogan, but there's also some, you know, non-common, if you will, uncommon uh, trademarks like scent, um, color, um, sound, all of those are, are trademarks as well. So many different trademarks that exist. And then when we're talking about copyrights, what we're really talking about is um, content or um, original works of authorship. So uh, copyright protection is more about protecting your rights in your authorship. So your right to use um, your work of art or your music or your book or your website, um, your right to reproduce it and your right to um, um, offer it to, to the public for distribution. So trademarks, source identifiers, copyrights, think content. Okay, okay. Uh, how about... How about this? How can I maintain and renew my trademark once it's registered? Yeah, that's a, that's a, a great question. So um, trademark registration is a bit unique in that your registration will remain effective and valid so long as you continue to use your trademark in commerce. So unlike a patent or copyright, there are set terms um, for that uh, registration. So for Trademark, the first way to, to maintain that registration is to continue to use your trademark in the marketplace. You want to use it um, in the same manner in which it's registered. There are you know, some slight variations you can make to the trademark, um, but rule of thumb is use it, continue to use it exactly as it's registered in connection with the goods or services in which it's registered with, right? So one continuous use. Number two um, is going to sound, I think maybe a little strange, but monitoring. A second way to uh, maintain your registration is to monitor your trademark. Why? Um, because when you submitted your application to the USPTO, what you were basically saying was um, this trademark, this source identifier is distinctive, it's unique, and it can only point to my business. 
And when the USPTO registered your trademark, they said, we agree with you. This trademark is unique and it, it can only identify your business. So you want to monitor the trademark to make sure it maintains its distinctiveness, that no other people in your business, in your industry, are using anything exact or similar. Because if the marketplace starts to... Um, come filled with similar or confusingly similar trademarks, then your ability to renew your trademark may be impacted. So number one, continuous use. Number two, monitor. And then number three, very simply, you need to <laughs> fill out and submit the renewal applications. All right. How about expanding a trademark into new uh, fields? Have you encountered that in your professional practice? Is that a thing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's, um, you know, it's a common question that we have from clients, either uh, clients that already have their trademark registered and they, they've expanded business into different areas, services, products, uh, both. Um, or we have new clients who are thinking about selecting either one class and, you know, what's how do we expand this registration um, at some point? The, the answer is we cannot expand a registration. Uh, once a, an application is filed and submitted, the classifications that we put into that application are final. We cannot add to it. We can only take away. Um, same thing with the register. Um, once your trademark is registered, we cannot add to that registration. We can only take away. Um, so if you're looking to expand your registration into different classes, technically you have to file a new application. Um, you would technically have two separate registrations and on all that good stuff to track, um, but you can't technically expand. You can only file a new application to add to your intellectual portfolio. So would that suggest that it's a good idea to initially uh, file uh, in, bro in broader categories and broader classifications? Yeah, that's a, another uh, great question, Alex. So what I like to advise clients in the application process is um, what goods or services do you see yourself offering within the next five years? What intentions, what are your business intentions for the next five years? Because we can file an application um, individual classes as well um, as what we call intent to use, meaning you, you're not using that trademark in connection with those goods or services in the marketplace yet, but you have the intention to do so. Um, and so we can be a bit broader with that intent to use filing basis. That way we can put everything into a single application. Um, you only have to track one registration at, at that time with uh, putting everything in a single application. Um, but yeah, it gives you that broader scope from the start. And then if you find out that, you know, you, you no longer have the intent to roll out this product or this service, we can always remove it from the application. All right. Uh, analyzing worst case uh, scenarios. What does a business owner do? What are the options if a trademark application is denied? And, and when does this happen? Yeah, that's, um, you know, that's another good uh, question. So the first thing is to, if you filed the application uh, pro se, meaning you filed it um, on your own without an attorney representation, the first thing you really want to do is just have the application reviewed by an attorney. Um, this is actually very common. We have a lot of clients who come to us who've submitted the application on their own and they receive what is called an office action. Um, which is the USPTO's um, notification that they may deny um, registration of the of the trademark. So the first thing, if you file the application on your own, is to contact an attorney. We can take a look at what the reasonings are and, and what's going on. Oftentimes, we're able to um, take over the application and create a pathway to, to registration. Um, the other thing to note is that... Um, the USPTO, if they do deny the registration of your trademark, the only thing they're saying is, unfortunately, we cannot register this trademark. That doesn't mean that you cannot continue to use the trademark. So use of a trademark and registration of a trademark are two different things. So if you have the denial, you may want to rebrand because you may want to have a registered trademark, something that has a um, value, something that can grow over time and increase the, the asset of that trademark. Um, or you may just be comfortable with using a trademark that you cannot register. And a lot of people are comfortable with that for, for various reasons. But that has many pitfalls. 
Yeah, it does. So, you know, you really don't want to use a trademark um, that you can't register. Um, the benefit of trademark registration is the right of exclusivity, aka brand ownership. You are the only person in the country within that industry that can use the trademark, and then you can stop other people from doing so. Using a trademark that's unregistered really means you have no control over it. Anyone else can use it, confusingly similar, um, you know, et cetera. Um, so it's not recommended, but there's, you know, various reasons why. Um, one thing we can think about is descriptiveness. So um, trademarks that are descriptive, if they're describing a feature, function, purpose, an intended user of your product or service, it is descriptive and ineligible for trademark registration. Uh, many business owners prefer descriptive trademarks because when you hear it and you see it, you know exactly what that business offers. Um, so some, you know, clients are comfortable with a descriptive trademark that's unregisterable. Um, and it's just being educated in, in what that means for the brand. Pardon me if I may interject. So that was like Big Hats Incorporated or something like that. What's a, what's a descriptive trademark? Yeah, a descriptive trademark would be um, if I have a cell phone company and it's called Phones Limited or so happy, happy cell phones, right? Um, anything that's describing exactly what that product or service is. So if I'm, um, you know, a fitness coach, a personal trainer, and my business was um, personal training, right? That's descriptive of the services that I'm offering. So that's ineligible for trademark registration. Um, but again, oftentimes, um, some business owners just like to be descriptive. They like the audience, the, the the marketplace to know exactly what their product or service is just from hearing and seeing the trademark. And so they're comfortable with knowing that it's not something that they can protect. And, and as long as they understand what that means, then it's, I, don't, I don't see a problem with it. Have you handled any uh, rejection cases and uh, successfully yeah. helped uh, mitigate any issues? Yeah, I mean, right now, um, the it's called so an office action is what you receive if there's an issue identified with the trademark application. Um, the office action rate is above 50%. So a majority of trademarks that are filed receive some sort of um, issue identified by the USPTO. So um, defending the, the application is what I call it in responding to that office action is I'd say about 60% of, of what we do um, to, to make sure the trademarks are registered. But yeah, we are successful. Um, overall, the firm, we have a high success rate of overcoming the office actions. Um, we do have a, a skilled and knowledgeable team here. So we do very well with the responses. Um, oftentimes, again, it's just a lot of clients have gone through the process on their own. And there's some things that we can do to get the, the trademark back on its track to, to registration. Wonderful, wonderful. That that does uh, sound uh, sounds great. Uh, so taking a step back, what exactly is a trademark? And could you explain the concept and its significance? Yeah, so... What is a trademark? A trademark is a source identifier. I like to describe it as your brand's identity. It's how you appear in the marketplace. So it's your business name, it's your logo, it's your slogan. And then there's many, as we talked about, many uncommon trademarks that exist in businesses every day. So um, scent is a trademark. Um, if you ever popped open a, a bottle of Play-Doh, that is a trademark scent. Only Plato can use that scent. Wow, um, I remember that yeah. from my childhood, and so <laughs> right. my girlfriend's kid is also. And I was really amazed. It's the same scent, and some yep. kids and that's, some kids eat it actually. Yeah, that's a whole other topic, right? But that's why when you pop open, you know, um, and you know, another brand of non-Plato product, uh, a Plato knockoff, if you will. Um, generic Play-Doh, um, it doesn't smell the same, right? They can never make it smell like Play-Doh. But, but hold on, uh, Victoria. So you you would say that the aromatic esters, uh, that is the chemical compound responsible for stimulating the um, 
the 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 cells, the nerve cells of the nose, to respond. So it's like the chemical. The chemicals are the trademark. Yeah. So it's the scent. Whatever the formula. Right. Yeah. Whatever uh, formula you put together to create that scent, it's not the formula itself because that's a different type of intellectual property. But it's the smell that that formula creates. Uh, the, the perceived, scent. the perceived smell. So it actually, if someone else created the same smell using different ingredients, it would still. It, it said that you are copying our trademark smell, even though you're using different ingredients. You're imitating our intellectual property, and and yeah. that would be. Uh, right. you know basis for litigation yeah that's correct because a trademark gives you um exactly what's registered so that exact smell if you will or anything confusingly similar um so again we're talking about two different types of intellectual property we're talking about the scent itself and then we're also talking about the formula of how you create that scent so that would be more of a patent type of protection or a trade secret and then we're talking about the scent, the the identity of, of opening that bottle and smelling it. All right. Um, so it's kind of like if you had you were blindfolded and you popped open a bottle and you didn't know what was in it and you smelled it. And you'd be like, oh, this is Play-Doh because its identity is its scent. Yeah, yeah. I've read a lot about uh, McDonald's uh, smell marketing that they, uh, the, the scent of the french fries which are made using a very uh, specific uh, type of uh, potato and then there is also a little a little bit of a uh, uh, beef lard i don't remember the exact uh, what's it called but it is a uh, and this and this and they you know they dissipate the smell through the ventilation systems and they attract people uh you know incoming customers who just take a whiff and then they're uh, they're oh, like not... when you're driving by and you smell McDonald's, you're like, oh, I need some McDonald's. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, um, so, yeah, so we have name, logo, slogan, scent, trade dress is also another trademark. It's just a fancy way of saying a design feature that you have um, either on your product itself or like packaging. Oh, so it's not um, a dress. I thought you were referencing like, you know, a nice... Uh... No, <laughs> it's the appearance of a product. Right. So an example of this one would be like Louboutin. So the red uh, bottom of the shoe, that is a trade dress, right? So when you see somebody with red on the bottom of the shoes, you automatically think of a certain brand. Um, another type of trademark is color. So um, you, uh, UPS Brown is a trademark color, T-Mobile Magenta, Tiffany Blue, I think Target Red is a, a trademark. Wow. So color, yeah, color is um, a trademark as well. And is the last one- in Pantones and like the Pantone, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but it's like uh, there's a certain f uh, way this is uh, designated? Yeah, so when we're talking about um, some of like the scent, the trade dress, the color, and then the last one would be sound. Um, these trademarks have to acquire what we call secondary meaning in the marketplace. So UPS Brown, um, they've been using Brown for, you know, since I think like the 1980s or something, probably earlier than that. Um, but it wasn't registered until I think about 2018, 2019. Um, so these are the type of trademarks that you have to acquire secondary meaning, which is just a fancy way of saying when someone hears it, sees it, smells it, they only think of, of one business. Um, so to answer your, your question directly, yes. So you have to specify in that application what that brown is. But remember, trademark registration gives you anything exact or confusingly similar. So if UPS has a, a trademark for the color brown in connection with uh, delivery services, you really cannot see another delivery service with the color brown because it would be confusingly similar. So that is why you only see the UPS with the color brown. Wow, that is some expert knowledge, Victoria. Thank you for that. Okay, I have a follow-up question. What about dance moves? You cannot protect... <laughs> So this is getting more into um, uh, copyright protection and you can't copyright uh, like a dance move itself. You can copyright a dance overall if you think of like um, like Swan Lake or, you know, the Nutcracker um, where it's a, a full out performance. 
but it's really hard to copyright just a dance move that anyone can do any day. All right, all right. Shucks, I'll have to write And a then whole ballet just, then. <laughs> and just to cover all our bases, the last uh, you know type of uh, trademark is a sound trademark. So um, Netflix, ta dum. Whenever you turn on Netflix and you hear that, that's a that's a trademark. And then um, like the MGM uh, Lion Roar before a movie, that that's a trademark as well. Uh, how can I protect my brand identity beyond trademarks? Yeah, this is um, a good question. I think what we're really talking about is um, overall brand protection. Um, so in a business, there, there's four types of intellectual property. Let's take a step back. There's patents, trademarks, copyrights, and what we call um, trade secrets. So a business will likely have various types of intellectual property, brand identity that um, they can protect. So you'd want to think about copyright protection, trademark protection, possibly patent protection. And then um, if there's something unique about your business that makes it um, profitable, that's when we're talking about a trade secret. Um, that's more of like Coca-Cola formulas type of things. Um, But outside of that, um, there are other ways to protect your brand identity. Um, the one that just jumps to top of mind from dealing with clients day to day is domain name registration. Um, when you are thinking about starting a business, starting a brand, and you have a business name in mind, the first thing you should really do is a search to see if that domain name is available. Um, It's 2024. Every business is online, right? Every business has a website. So if you are unable to secure that domain name because either someone else is using it or they just grabbed it to sell it, right? We know we have all of those um, companies out there just grabbing domain names. Um, if it's not available, then it may be that someone is already using that trademark and it's not worth investing too much time and money into it. Or you may be setting yourself up where people are going to get confused where to find you online and they're accidentally shopping somewhere else um, because the, the domain name is not what they think it is. So I think domain name um, registration is is top of mind outside of uh, trademarks, copyrights, patents, et cetera. Yes, a business owner, Daniel Mersing of Premier Staff uh, from Hollywood, California, was very adamant about um, about the the importance of uh, having a great domain name that is uh, corresponding, giving a clear message about the the business, and uh, Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I tell clients, it, it's the same thing with trademarks. Grab your domain name and then think of anything that's confusingly similar to your domain name. Um, think about common misspellings, um, things that sound alike. You, you just kind of grab up all those domain names. That way you create this atmosphere where you own your exact domain name that hopefully matches your business name, your trademark. And, and then you have anything that's confusingly similar, as well as like the .coms, .net, um, .org, you know, all the variations there as well. If you're doing it early enough, um, you can often grab up those domain names fairly cheap. Um, there is a common practice where um, uh, Companies, individuals monitor the trademark database. So if they see a, a trademark filed, they'll then go and secure, try to purchase that domain name and then sell it for a higher price. So it's always best to think about that domain name registration very early on, even possibly before submitting the, the trademark application. Nice, nice. What are the limitations of trademark protection on YouTube? You know, Alex, I just learned that YouTube is the number one search engine. I don't know in the world or in the U.S., but it's one of those. I had no idea. <laughs> People are too lazy. Reading reading is, you know, no longer the thing, it seems, yeah. you know, for, for getting information. 
So I, you know, when I search something, I go to Google, but apparently I'm searching the wrong place. I need to search on YouTube, but um, there are limitations to um, uh, trademark protection on YouTube. So if we think about what, what a trademark is, then, then it makes sense, right? So a trademark is a source identifier. So what you can protect on YouTube with trademark registration is your name itself, right? Um, your, your branded name, if you have a logo that you're using on there, if you have a slogan that you're using on there, all of those source identifiers is what you can protect um, for your YouTube channel. Um, outside of that, the majority of content that is placed on YouTube is really copyright registration, videos, music, you know, how to um, videos, all the other stuff that <laughs> people are putting on uh, on YouTube these days. Right. All oh, of that is a of, it's, a, it's a jungle out there. I, you know, I need to maybe spend more time on YouTube, um, but all of that is content, right? So all of that is what we would protect via copyright registration. Um, so really, uh, if you you have a YouTube channel and you're a YouTuber and that's your, your business and, and how you're generating income, you really want two forms of protection, your trademark, protect the identity, and then the content with copyright registration. All right. How can I assess similarity to other trademarks? And here we're talking about global assessments based on oral, visual, and conceptual factors. Yeah, so this is one that I say you leave to the professionals. <laughs> so the purpose of trademark law, the reason why we have trademark registration and trademark statutes and examination procedures and all of this very complicated system is for one goal, and that is consumer confusion. The purpose of trademark law is to protect consumers for being confused about who is offering the goods or services in the marketplace. So when we're thinking about assessing similarity, what we're really talking about is a legal analysis of whether or not these trademarks are so similar that consumers would be confused. Um, trademark similarity, likelihood of confusion is a 13 factor legal analysis that um, we look to to compare to trademarks. So just at a very high level, if someone were trying to research if a trademark is available, um, and they wanted some highlights, you know, two highlights, I would give them one, look at the similarity of the trademark itself. Does it look, sound, mean, and have the same overall commercial impression? Uh, the two trademarks, right? Do they, do they have those similarities? The second um, key factor is relatedness. Are the trademarks being used on exact or related goods or, or services? Um, so those are the two, the two big ones, similarity of the trademarks overall and then relatedness. Are they being used on similar or um, related goods or services? But really, it's just better to leave it to the professionals for that one. <laughs> Indeed. Great, Victoria. Thank you so much for that. This was a great interview. And I uh, hope to see you soon. See you, Alex. <laughs> Bye. Protect your brand with Trademarkia. Register your trademark on trademarkia.com.